So this is my Technix SL1600 turntable. I've had this turntable for a few years now, uh, but it needs a little bit of work and I also want to perform a modification to it. Um, the work that it needs is the uh, Tonearm Q dampener. When I got it, it was totally dry, it dropped like a brick, but I actually didn't have the correct type of silicone lubricant that you need, so I just used some silicone plumber's grease that I had on hand, which seemed to work at the time, but over the last year or so it's been dropping faster and faster and it's to the point now where it makes a pretty hard bang when it hits the record so I'm going to take it apart again and re-lubricate that uh, the other thing I'm going to do is perform a modification to allow the playback of 78 RPM uh, records on this turntable it's actually not too difficult of a mod to do uh, being a um, DC servo type circuit and not the quartz lock that the Mark II's had. It's actually pretty trivial to uh, add 78 RPM to a turntable like this. So let's get started. Uh, when you remove the dust cover on one of these, always make sure that it's up so that the spring tension at the back is released. Otherwise, if you try to pick it up while it's down, the hinges will snap back and it'll actually um, can actually cause cracking on the uh, dust cover. Just lift it straight up. Next you want to lock the tone arm down. Remove the head shell. Protect your stylus or take the stylus off. Remove the platter mat. Removing the platter is easy. You just lift up while pushing down on the spindle. You'll notice that the inside of this platter doesn't have any dampening material like uh, some of the Mark II's have and that's something you can do to quiet this turntable down keep this from ringing. Next we just need to remove this shield. There's four screws. Pops right out. Just lift right out like that. So this is the circuitry for this turntable. It's very simple as you can see. This is the motor stator right here with the individual coils this is the power supply section this is the actual motor driver and speed control circuitry there are pots right here to set the speeds and there are also two trimmers right here to set the speeds uh, one thing you can do if you're having trouble getting the speed exactly on like it tent when you get close it jumps usually that means these pots in that spot are getting worn out you can try to use some um, deoxid on there to try to get these spots cleaned up but another thing you can do is to move the position of the sweet spot to a different place on the pot by adjusting these trimmers slightly so these will change the center of where the exact speed is on these and you can wear a different part of your potentiometer which will let you give you back your precise adjustment now this is a fuse that should uh, not be a problem this is uh, the one big capacitor on here um, I might replace this. I've noticed some hum when I turn this turntable on that's being picked up by the uh, by the cartridge and I suspect there's some noise on the power supply. I'm going to actually check for that and see what the condition of this power supply cap is. This is the power switch that turns on the uh, power to the whole turntable actually. Uh, it goes connects here so anytime the turn tone arm is moved over it trips the switch and also when you click the start lever it also trips the switch so this arm right here is for the automatic stop when the tone arm reaches the end of the record it kicks over this arm which on this end puts a tooth down into a little sprocket that's on the bottom of the spindle here now this older type of turntable automatic turntable like many others the automatic mechanism is driven by the platter motor not a separate motor under the tone arm like some of the more modern ones have so in this 
arm gets kicked over, the motor moves this slider over, which is what moves the tone arm around, sets it down, and moves it back and forth. This area can get a little gummed up. Uh, when I got this turntable, it had been completely doused in oil <laughs> to try to free it up. I had to clean it up. There was oil down in the pan and everything. You don't want to over-oil it. Uh, just a little, if it feels really stiff, you, it's maybe worth cleaning the grease out of it, but you can also just spray a small amount of silicon oil or even a little 3-in-1 oil will help free it up or better yet take it apart clean it all up re-grease it put it back together so to replace the fluid and the Q dampener of this turntable it's quite a bit of work um, in some turntables they let you lift the cylinder which is right here up so that you can pull it out from the top re-lubricate it set it back in they made that impossible on this turntable. The screw that attaches this uh, arm here that lifts the tone arm is has a hex head and it's embedded in a hex hole. So there's no way to turn the screw without turning the whole arm and the arm is ca held captive by a pin over here. I have tried to lift it up and turn it but that doesn't buy you anything. You need to turn it multiple times and it just it catches it everywhere else. So The only way to do this is to take it all apart and remove the whole tone arm assembly and take it apart from the bottom side. This uh, anti-skate wheel has a real dry, cheap feel to it, normally, uh, but a small amount of silicone grease on the axle of this really gives it a nice smooth feel, so I did that to this one when I took it apart the first time. So the way the suspension works on this turntable is the feet are attached to the top, and the bottom plate actually floats on springs, as you can see, and the tone arm follows it. Mine's making a weird squeaky noise because of the springs in the rubber. So to lift this off, we need to remove the four feet, and that'll let us lift the whole top off. So whenever you flip a turntable over, always, always, always support it on something. I just have it on a couple of small boxes. You never want to put any weight on the tone arm. So next you just need to remove the four screws for the feet. And then we flip it back over. Okay, to remove the top of the plinth, first we need to disconnect the cables for the motor, the power switch, and the tone arm wiring. Then we set the anti-skate to zero, unlock your tone arm, move it to the inside to clear this area, and then you can literally lift it and just swing it off. Just like that. So the tone arm base here is held on by three screws. There's two on this side. And there's one in the back here underneath a little rubber plug. You should be able to lift it up carefully. Watch the tone arm wiring. There's the bottom of the tone arm. This right here is the dampener cylinder. And you can see there's some grease leaking out of it, so that's probably why it's moving a bit too fast. These are the tone arm wires careful with those, they're delicate. So we need to disassemble this a little bit to get this guy out. So this is the cylinder right here, the end of it. Down underneath this plate there's a plastic piece that's attached to the cylinder, so you can't pull it out this way, you can't push it out that way. You have to remove this plate to get it out. And this plate's held by these two screws here. It also interferes, this arm interferes a little bit, and the spring has to be removed. This is the anti-skate spring. Be very careful. It's a delicate mechanism.
I'm going to swing it out of the way and put it over there. So next I have to remove this earring right here because we need to slide this plate off the cylinder. The cylinder will not come out because it's attached to that arm on the other side. Watch out for this spring. Don't let it go flying away. You need that. Keeping the underside of the tone arm parts separate. One screw I forgot right here. Have to move this arm out of the way a little bit. Alright, now I should be able to get this out. There we go. Again, watch out for this anti skate spring. There we go. There we go. There's the cylinder. There's the piston. You're not going to be able to get the piston any further than this. Now at this point you might be able to unscrew it. You can get this plastic piece to spin probably. But I'm not going to bother. Clean off the old incorrect viscosity silicon oil. A little denatured alcohol dissolves it pretty well. Because I used the wrong thing, I want to get it all out. If yours is dry, you don't need to bother cleaning it up so much. You might be able to see on the camera, I also greased this area here. And that's just the tone arm lever where it presses up on the piston. I just did that to give it a smoother feel. You don't have to do that. But it has kind of a dry feel initially. So this is the dampening fluid I'm going to use. It's the 300,000 CST stuff. There is a thicker version yet, 600,000. Hopefully this will do the job for me though. Just going to put a small amount in these grooves. Alright, so when putting it back together, make sure the little white plastic part attached to the piston here is facing that way so that the little cam on the lever can push down on it. Then we just set the plate back on. And put the screws back in. Okay, I'm going to put our anti skate arm back in place. Again, being careful about the spring. sure it moves freely. Down here is where I added a little grease to improve the feel of this adjustment. Our spring back on. Retaining washer. to hold it all down with your finger so it doesn't go flying away. Then the E-clip. There we go. Nice and slow.
That should work a lot better. All right, this job's done. So I've performed the mod here. I didn't actually shoot me soldering these wires on, but uh, I'll explain how it all works. So basically, the way the motor controller works here is that pin one of the IC generates a sawtooth waveform, and that goes through a series of resistors and capacitors and gets fed back into pin 24 of the IC. Now, depending on the re resistors in the chain of resistors, it'll determine the speed of the platter. So if you look carefully at the schematic, the only difference between the 33 RPM speed and the 45 RPM speed, which is controlled by the switch here, this is the back of that switch, is the switching in and out of uh, R9, which is a 39K resistor. So 39K of resistance added to the chain slows you down from 45 to 33. In other words, taking out 39K gets you up from 33 to 45. So if you do the calculation, you'll find that you need to take out another 44 or so K of resistance to get up to 78. So there's lots of different ways you can do that. I chose the path of least modification here. <laughs> this resistor right here that I've put my switch across is a 62K resistor, it's R10. And what I've done is I can, when this switch closes, it puts another 25k in parallel with that 62k which gives me about 18 or so k of resistance so that brings me that gives me the 44k or so I need to take out of the circuit to give me 78 rpm so that's one way to get 44k out of it uh, the caveat with this approach is that this resistor is in the chain for both 45 and 33 rpm speed for this to work, you need to have it set to 45, and then you flip the switch, and then you'll get 78. However, if you go back to 33 over here, you'll get some weird speed in between 33 and 45. You won't, you won't get 33. You have to make sure you flip this switch back off. So if you do want to do this mod in such a way that it only affects the 45 RPM speed and not 33, it's technically possible, though it's a little more complicated. What you can do is physically swap R9 with R10. So this is R9 right here, I'm pretty sure. And this is R10. You'd, if I flip the board over, you'd be able to see it. So you would physically desolder these two resistors, switch them around. That will not affect the 33 RPM speed at all. It will change the 45 RPM speed. It'll make it go faster, actually, which then you'll have to adjust it back down by using the trim pot and possibly even the pot over here. Uh, the idea is to add as much resistance with the trim pot as you can. It's a 50k trim pot. And then you can put the switch in parallel with that trim pot and get the 44k out of the circuit that you need. Except it won't be actually be 44k, it'll be less than that, so you'll have to do some math. This is too confusing. Just go with the easy route. <laughs> put the switch across this guy. Put about 25k on the switch so that when the switch is in one position, 25k of resistance is across this guy, and when the switch is in the other position, it's open. It's not changing this resistor at all. So I've used some small twisted pair of wiring here. Um, I used a glob of hot glue to take the strain relief off the solder joints, and then I just tied it to this cable tie here with this uh, with the motor harness. And then on the switch itself, once I had it soldered and checked out, I already tested all this. I put a glob of glue over this too, just to just to protect the wires and the solder joints. Alright, so it's time to put the tone arm back on the uh, frame here. So there's a pin right here and this lever here. They just need to be on this side of this plastic here and here and here. So with everything in this position in the parked position, you just set it straight down and everything should line up perfectly. like that. Three black machine screws hold this down. Put the rubber plug back on. So there's two other adjustments in here. I'll show them again later but just real quick. One is under this plug. This is the position, the start position, where the needle will be dropped for the various sizes. So you can adjust this if it's not hitting the run end just right. And then this adjustment here, which you can adjust through a hole in the black plate that goes here, is for the stop position. 
It's a very, very touchy adjustment. Both of them are. One thing I wanted to point out real quick is where the phono cables attach. So I had to replace my cables because mine were badly damaged. Uh, there was a huge chunk missing. It was dug through all the way into the uh, inner insulator with a big part of the shield missing, actually in two places. I'm not sure what happened if a dog chewed it or what. Um, it's important if you're going to re try to replace your phono cables on a turntable that does not have a built-in preamp like this one that you use a low capacitance or at least relatively low capacitance cable. These cables are just some cheaper ones from Amazon but they have a fairly large inner insulator and their capacitance is a reasonable amount. It's not, they're not great cables but they're good enough for a short run like this. This is just a little three-footer. There's a reason why many turntables have cables pre-attached. It's because the capacitance of the cable is important, otherwise you get high frequency roll-off. So if, you're, if you've got the bug to swap out your cables, make sure you're using a cable that has a reasonably low capacitance, something that is on the order of what already came with the turntable. You can also get really, really low capacitance cables from like Blue Jeans cables, and those are great too. They're just very expensive. Uh, this little guy here is the ground. Um, very often this end is missing. I just put a little crimp guy on there, but that was missing, of course. So anyway, I just wanted to show that. It goes through this little strain relief here, down through, and then gets soldered to the board here, and I put a little strap there to add to the strain relief because these cables are thicker than the original ones. So next we put the plinth back on, the top of it. So again, anti-skate to zero, move the tone arm into the middle, move this up out of the way. Watch out for the cables, so there's the tone arm cable, this cable, power cable and also my new cable the switch which I'm going to tuck inside here I'll show you in a minute there we go lock our tone arm back down now put the screws and the feet back in Okay, flip it back over, again supported by boxes to keep the weight off the tone arm. Let's put the feet back on. Don't over torque these screws. That's the bottom. This is a removable panel here which exposes the back of the um, auto start automatic mechanism but you only need to go in there if you need to deal with lubrication or other issues okay we have the pin put back together so we need to reconnect the harnesses We've got the motor harness the tone arm and the power switch it usually likes to hide but you can usually fish it out Then we got to figure out what to do with our switch for our 78 RPM speed. There's a few different options. You can drill a hole in the bottom plate and have it stick out at an angle on the back or the side or the front if you want. I wouldn't drill any holes in the top of your plinth. to That'll be a permanent change and an irreversible change. If you put it on the bottom it'll be hidden. I decided to go with uh, putting a hole in the plate underneath the platter. So I drilled this hole here, right next to the 33 and 45 RPM trims. The switch will be right here. It'll sit under the platter. And I put it in a place so that it's accessible through this hole right here. So I can just flip it like that by lifting up the mat. The only issue is you have to make sure that the switch doesn't stick up too high. One way to deal with that is to use a slider switch, because those are usually pretty low profile. I didn't have one handy, <clears throat> so I used this uh, toggle switch and I just cut off the arm a little bit. So 
So the toggle switch has a double nut, so I want to make sure it's as low as I can get it. So again, so it's not sticking up too high. So there we go. So now remember, when you're thinking about the height of this and not hitting the bottom of the planter, keep in mind that this can move up and down. So really you should measure it from the lowest possible position to make sure this clears. I'll put our screws back in. So you're supposed to lubricate this bearing every 2,000 hours. This is uh, the oil that you're supposed to use. I've done it more recently than that, so I'm not going to oil it right now. There's our platter. Okay, so next we need to set our tone arm back up. Got my cartridge already mounted to a head shell here. Mount that to the tone arm. Flip the guard up so that everything is exactly as it will be when the record is playing. So the first thing we want to do if you don't have a digital scale is to balance the tone arm to null it out. So you want to adjust the weight. So this is tricky with an automatic turntable because it'll start up on you. So you want to make sure that it's unplugged or switched off so that you don't let your stylus hit the um, platter anywhere. So you're looking for a balance so that the needle is just hovering over the record. Just like that. So this is your null point. So now you hold the weight and just turn the, the digits so that zero is lined up with the line and now you know you're at zero grams. So theoretically, you should be able to set this to the desired tracking force, which for this cartridge is 2 grams. But it's always a good idea to check it with a digital scale. Set the scale on the platter. Zero it out. Two point zero two grams. Pretty good. So once you're confident that your gauge on the back here is pretty accurate or not accurate, you'll know whether or not you need to uh, be paranoid about checking it with a scale, but I always check it anyway. Next you want to set the tracking force. For starters, you just set it to be the same value that you're using for your tracking force. Now, this is a microline stylus, so I happen to know that it needs a bit more anti-skate, so about two and a half grams is about right. And there we go. It's one arm set up. Alright, so we have the turntable put all back together again. Let's go ahead and dial in the speeds. I did spray the adjustments with uh, deoxidator F5 as well as the two trim pots, in case I needed to tweak those. But let's see if 33 and 45 are stable on their own. 33 was always okay, but 45 was tough. 33 looks good. Check 45. There we go. Let's try 78. So we flip our switch. We leave it on 45. And there's our 78 speed. Now we can't use the strobes here to dial it in. We'd have to use a strobe disc and then adjust the 45 to get it exactly right. But I know we're in the ballpark because I checked it earlier. So there you go. Modified and serviced Technics SL1600.